FX Medicine is your gateway to news, resources and information on the safe, evidence-based approach to practising complementary and integrative medicine. Visit fxmedicine.com.au to sign up for e-news and stay up to date with the latest research, podcasts and industry information. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining me in the studio again today is Dr. Mark Donohoe, a man who I have much respect for, who is an integrative practitioner of many years. Not that many. <laughs> and who is quite famous for taking on those really recalcitrant conditions that people have been everywhere, seen everyone, got no relief, and finally they end up on Mark's door. Today we're going to be discussing in part one of a two-part series, Epstein-Barr virus. Mark Donohoe, welcome to FX Medicine. How are yeah, you? It's good to be back again. We're going to talk of my favourite pathogen. Now, this is really interesting because EBV, in my not nursing knowledge, was just you know Kissing's disease and and something that you you got in your teenage years. But I've since learnt a heck of a lot more about this. Indeed, in serious disease. Take us through, first, the history of Epstein-Barr virus. Okay. Well, firstly, my history with it is this was a big thing in 1988-89 when we were first kind of identifying the term of chronic fatigue syndrome. Hmm. We kind of got to that case definition by 95. But in the early days, people will remember what now is called chronic fatigue syndrome. The Americans called chronic Epstein-Barr virus syndrome. And oh. it went back to Paul Cheney's work. And the original work done on these oddly fatigued people showing high antibodies to Epstein-Barr. So there was an early phase of chronic fatigue syndrome where the American view was, this is all just chronic Epstein-Barr virus. We will have a drug for that and we will kill off that and that will cure the people with chronic fatigue syndrome. But how, but how do you kill off a virus? Yes. They're, so they're, <laughs> That's part two, isn't that's it? That's right. This is like the war on cancer, the war on Epstein-Barr, the war on everything. Mm -hmm. It looks simple when you start it and you think, we can do this. And then you find the complexity. And like most bugs and most pathogens, they have tricks. And Epstein-Barr has become a favourite of mine because the variety of tricks that it uses to maintain itself is spectacular. Again, one thing that most people don't realise is we die with way more DNA in us than we are born with. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? You know, you, you think DNA is a constant thing, but the viruses are injecting DNA and we have Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, all these others just insert themselves in our genome. So we actually die with about 5% more DNA than we were born with. And most of that is viral DNA. Some of it may come from other pathogens like mycoplasma. There are other methods of insertion into the DNA. In the deep, long history, we have this stuff in our DNA which came from the genome um, uh, project where we called it junk DNA. And we're, how part of this turned out is 10% of our DNA, more than our genetics, yeah. you know, the so-called human genetics, but 10% yeah. of the total DNA was human endogenous retroviruses. These are herpes viruses, and most people don't know this, but mm. glandular fever is a herpes virus. Mm. It's human herpes 4. So most people oh. with glandular fever have part, been part of the long tradition of these viruses getting in. Occasionally, they copy themselves into germ cells, and those germ cells then transfer across generations. And we've always thought of those viruses, the junk DNA is just dead DNA. You don't have to worry too much about it. The fact is that the viruses that get themselves successfully into us have been, have been persistent viruses that worked over hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of years, because they're also in primates. They're in other mammals as well. So they got in, they form a kind of backbone of our DNA, and we thought it was just junk. Now we're seeing that people with, say, mm -hmm. chronic fatigue syndrome, we're expressing antibodies against those so-called dead viruses. It's like the Titans, you know, the whole history of the Titans being put down underground by the, by the gods and the Titans are making their way out again. The viruses are starting to show their face again 
and it looks very much like herpes viruses get themselves into us, we're carriers of them, and eventually they make their move again on us at a later time. Is this along the lines of junk RNA, junk DNA? Junk DNA. So or we were surprised. You'll remember the Genome Project. It was thought that we were going to have hundreds of thousands of genes. And to make a human, it looked like the minimum was going to be 150 to 200,000 genes. And so, as you know, Alessio Fasano said, if wheat takes 180,000 genes, yeah. you, we're more complex than wheat, surely. Yeah. But 23,000, 24,000 um, genes just didn't seem enough to make a human. What was worse is, along the way, they were looking for the genes that express proteins. And so these are the active genes that express a protein. And that, and we understood, you know, from DNA to RNA to protein, we knew the, the mechanism. In the Genome Project, some smart guy came along and said, can I buy from you all the junk DNA, the stuff that doesn't do anything? And the rights were sold to a single person for everything that wasn't expressing a protein. What? Uh, and people said, well, why would you want to know? It's just, you know, that's just the backbone. That's just the stuff that holds it together. Within five years of reaching the end of it, it was clear that the guy had bought a gold mine because most of the non-expressing stuff is epigenetic. The whole change in that idea of it's a blueprint that you just are stuck with to it's a menu that you select from and the epigenetics are the process of which genes are expressed, which genes are non-expressed. What was junk DNA is anything but junk. It's regulatory DNA, it's old viral DNA, it's some bacterial DNA. It's a gold mine of other modifying influences. Can I just ask a question around that? Are you saying that some guy bought the pay, the rights yeah. to use, this has got to be a bank of DNA from, is it yeah. hundreds, thousands it's, of it's individuals? It's basically when you do all of those base pairs, you get, you know, you read off two mm. billion base pairs. Mm. Only a tiny percentage of that has anything to do with expressing a yeah, protein. Sure. So yeah. it goes, you know, CGAT expresses onto RNA and then it moves on to protein. And we thought that was what DNA was for. The rest of it was just like little bits of wire that held it all together so that it stayed there. And in fact, the discussion early on was, why would, it, why would some idiot pay good money for something that's worthless? And it, of course, like most things in biology, nothing's worthless. Mm. Biology is very efficient and what it holds together is methods and changes and ways of expressing genes, which we had no idea about before we started it. But when we ended up with only one-tenth of the number of genes we expected, there had to be something else that was making a human as complicated and as complex as it was. Okay, but if but if somebody's now got the rights to investigate this junk DNA, could they, if they compared, so let's say retrospectively, hmm. um, with those people that might have developed certain diseases, yeah. could they be the ones who have, quote unquote, the answers to teasing out if... Yeah. EBV is a causative agent. Yeah, they can. And they can have the answers. I mean, this, this guy has sold it off to other people. This was arbitrage. You know, I get it for a few million. I sell it for a few hundred million to a few billion. And so it's not that this guy is doing all the work. Right. It's guy, the no, guy no, has, has the ownership of the rights to the use of it. And of course, me in medicine, we've moved to epigenetics in a very, very big way. Yeah. Now we're moving to understanding that the retroviruses and the, uh, the herpes-like viruses that are able to copy themselves into DNA are sitting there in large amounts. And when they start to express, when those things become active again, which we thought were dead, when those things become active again, people who have chronic fatigue syndrome develop antibodies. It's a tough call. Is this autoimmunity? Really, it's antibodies to fight a virus yeah. that the body sees, but yeah. the virus is built in. So we're fighting ourselves without ever having realised that 10% of our DNA is not ourselves. It is from a viral or other back, uh, background source. So, so I've got to ask the question, why is it that we tend to see EBV present itself symptomatically in the teenage sort of years, this yeah. kissing disease, well, it is a kissing infectious disease. mononucleosis? However, How's uh, it spread? if you go around the world, Epstein-Barr, I think of as one of the champion pathogens of all time. We'll, we'll just go through that on this occasion because the answer in part two to what do you do about it is going to rely on understanding in part one how the hell does this thing make its living? Mm. You know, it's got a job to do. Its job is to replicate itself. Humans have turned out to be a great host for doing that. If you take the worldview, and from the human perspective, in Africa, 
you see Burkitt's lymphoma as yeah. one of the outcomes. Why? Because kids at age two get their Epstein-Barr viruses when the tonsils are big, when the, lymphic, when the lymphatics are high, and when many of them have been undernourished. And so you have people close living quarters, unwell mothers and unwell families, and high transmission of Epstein-Barr virus. So that in Africa, in certain parts of Africa, 95% of two-year-olds have already got exposure to Epstein-Barr virus. That's understandable. The living conditions, the closeness of that, the unhealthiness of people opens the gate for the virus to spread. And a whole different problem arises there. There's no chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a luxury when the alternative is dying of starvation and, and survival. But Burkitt's lymphoma, a kind of escalation of the lymphatics of the uh, of the tonsils and the adenoids and the tissue in the upper respiratory tract means that it's a very common outcome. And there is an upside to this. Finally, the National Institute of Health in America has paid attention and said, well, look, it's so strongly associated with that lymphoma. And in Asia, it's associated with nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It's now an oncovirus. And so once you establish something as an oncovirus, the war on cancer, the funding for the war on cancer in the National Institute of Health means now there's a big move to developing drugs and strategies for the prevention of Epstein-Barr and for the killing or the elimination of the virus once a person's infected. Now, that's future work. Yeah. That's just started in the last four years, but it does mean when the Americans turn their attention to something and say, how do we sabotage this virus? They will develop techniques and ways that we just don't have today. So now, they get it as a two-year-old, yeah. uh, generally. In Asia, especially in the smoking population, they tend to get nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Now, both Burkitt's and nasopharyngeal carcinoma from Epstein-Barr are very rare in America, Australia, New Zealand, yeah. in our countries, in the countries that we think of, partly because we are not in poverty to begin with and we don't have such close living quarters and ill health in the early years of life. Most of us are far from malnourished, although you could argue the nutrition is not that great. So what we can say in Australia is about 10% of 12-year-olds have ever run into Epstein-Barr virus. 95% of people have run into it by age 25. So in that roughly 12 mm -hmm. or 13-year period, virtually all of us become infected. It is rare for, to find a 30-year-old who has not become infected. So we get it at a different time. Most practitioners will know this story, that when is the number one year that we see this happen? High school certificate year, yeah, the yeah. end year of your schooling. When stresses are high, sleep is poor, you're going out and you're maybe kissing for the very first time, and that hits maybe up to 5%, one in out of, uh, out of every 20 students, hits them in that year sufficient to disrupt studies and often just turn them back to have to repeat an entire year. Okay, but what I don't understand is, uh, I've I've read, there's a couple of parts to this question. Mm -hmm. The first thing is that when you're talking about impoverished nations, let's say developing nations, developing nations. that um, one of the factors was malaria, that -hmm. it was sort of comorbid with malaria. So there's a, a mode of transmission. What interests me though, if it's salivary thing and we call it kissing's disease, well, if it's kissing, your mum kisses you yeah. and your mum very often kisses you on the lips. So, so I have certainly, to stop as a, you. certainly as a baby, shot sure, stop. Certainly Mothers as a baby, rarely exchange the saliva that a teenager does with a girlfriend or boyfriend, right? So there is right. salivary expression of the volume. virus. So volume. and so yeah, yeah, so salivary exchange or fluid exchange seems to be an important thing. That's not true when babies are very young. They've got breast milk. There are other potential methods by through which uh, babies mm. are exposed, mm. and it doesn't mm. require saliva. But in Australia, you generally think, well, there are maybe half the people who have antibodies for Epstein-Barr virus do not even remember having been ill, but they remember a family member having been ill. And what's clear is you can get transmission of the virus if there's just enough to tickle the immune system, but not enough to overwhelm it, yep. then you get uh, almost a trivial disease. Yep. People describe it as a and cough or a cold a and they become immune to it. So they've effectively self-vaccinated. The strange Not thing, a carrier. Well, no, they don't become a carrier. So I'll come to this in a yeah, second. Okay. The, the virus has a period of time where if sufficient numbers breed up, it expresses itself through the saliva. Mm. The living, the home yep. for Epstein-Barr virus is the nasopharynx. So 
100% of people who get glandular fever have great big lymph nodes. The way we define glandular fever is a clinical disease. Big lymph nodes, swollen tonsils, all of that. When you look at those, the people initially present to doctors and the doctor will look down and say, it's either tonsillitis or glandular fever. The typical story is the doctor says, I'll give you a penicillin just in case it's the throat. What they don't realize is that if it's glandular fever, you knock off the other bugs around there, you actually increase the expression yep. for the Epstein-Barr virus. Right. So the worst cases of EBV is when the helpful doctor has said, why don't we just try a course of antibiotics? So the passage the passage onto the nasopharynx is very important. We also had a tendency in Australia to remove tonsils. And tonsillectomies ah, yes. were not a great idea. If you want your immune system to be at the point where the virus gets in and you want it to develop a good, strong response, having tonsils was a great idea. And the reason that tonsillectomies are so hard to come by these days is doctors realize too late, you know, what do we do? We remove tonsils trying to stop polio. We caused paralytic polio. It was a, a surgical procedure that if you had your lymph node, you had your tonsils out 30 days before or after exposure to the uh, Coxsackie virus, you get paralytic disease. So we stopped doing it based on we thought the tonsils were the problem area that accumulated infections, and if we got rid of the tonsils, we'd be much the better for it. What we learned was if you remove the tonsils, you take away the primary defense, the early yeah. warning system, yeah. and you allow the bug to become far more established. It looks bad on the tonsils, but the tonsils are doing their job. Yeah, as is. long as the tonsils aren't overwhelmed by yep. because um, of poor nutrition. That's or right. Or, or, or because like of lots and lots of sugar and because they get strep growing and staph growing and all of that. So yeah. a lot of tonsils do have to be removed, not decrying that. It's a little bit like you know, cesareans. There's a lot of good reasons for medical procedures, but the routine doing of it was thought to be helpful to the host. And what it did was remove frontline defenses that allow for good balanced immune responses to develop. The, the same virus gets into the nasopharynx and there's no lymphatic tissue around, that's a lot tougher for the person to get through. When you're talking about um, the viral component of DNA, mm. are you saying that EBV is one of those viral components? I, I'm saying EBV... Or virus, an archaic sort uh, of virus. No, I'm saying EBV... Viruses, I think these viruses are correctly described as DNA wrapped up, you know, bad news DNA wrapped up in a protein coat. What happens is the little protein coat runs around the place, docks with a cell. Yep. When Injects. it docks with a cell, it injects its DNA in. That DNA wanders its way down into the nucleus. It even may be facilitated. And this is the tricky bit. Do we consider all viruses pathogens? Is there something about viruses and us which is symbiotic? that the viruses may do something for us and that we shepherd DNA. Raw DNA coming through the cytoplasm and making all its way to the nucleus, that sounds an odd thing. But there are docking mechanisms and transfer mechanisms which make it plausible that we and viruses have a symbiotic reaction and that we've made the same mistake about viruses as we made about all bacteria, you know, we have now and a microbiome. And herbs versus weeds. Yeah, <laughs> that, that we keep on making this Probiotics mistake that something versus... wild and apparently sickening yeah. must be something to be avoided at all costs. And so I think that we are starting to rethink the Pasteurian view. It's not just bad bugs everywhere just waiting to attack us. It's we have a great relationship with the 99% of the bugs. We, in fact, depend on them. Mm. Occasionally, one gets away from us, you know, a salmonella or a shigella or something like that, and all hell breaks loose, and our immune response to it goes berserk and mm. does a lot of damage. And we spend a lot of our time attacking pathogens or finding ways to attack pathogens, but unfortunately take the goodies out along the way. I'm not suggesting yet that Epstein-Barr is a goodie. But Epstein-Barr is an opportunistic virus that does some important jobs, which we'll come to later on. You know, it gets into you, it makes a home, and unlike all the other DNA viruses, it's little ringlets, it's little circles that sit in the nucleus but outside our normal DNA. And so that gives it certain advantages. One of those advantages is all the drugs we've developed for shingles and for cytomegalovirus and for genital herpes and cold sores don't work very well with this one. So we inhibit a method of DNA transfer that requires the, the thing to be in linear DNA in a form that it, we're able to inhibit. The drugs that we've made for all the other herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr has escaped from largely, and you've got to use huge doses, multiple drugs. It's a real bugger to get the Epstein-Barr under control with, with drug therapy. 
I've got to I've got to say this is smacking so much of Prome- the movie Prometheus. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Oh. Uh, yeah, I mean this. this You're going to fly away on a spaceship I know, soon, Mark. I know. Like... <laughs> we we can talk later about what's the obvious way of humans leaving Earth. We package our DNA up and we put that out in on the a media. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. We you don't bother putting twenty people on a spaceship, although Hollywood loves it. But if you if you come back to this perspective of what's the virus's job in life, the virus's job is to make more viruses. A pretty simple game, and the viruses that are most successful are the ones that routinely transfer and don't kill their hosts. And the Epstein-Barr is a classic for one that very rarely kills its host, but it gets into 95% of people. And how do we know that? We measure antibodies in the general population. As I said, you know, by the time you're 25, you've got a 95% chance of having Epstein-Barr IgG. And this is one of the critical factors for doctors who do this testing, that if all you test for is immunoglobulin G, then you will find it in 95% of people. And I see this happening all the time. You must have chronic fatigue syndrome because you've got antibodies to the virus. Wrong. If you've just got antibodies to the virus, a herpes virus keeps on niggling, you create antibodies lifelong, and that's what keeps it in jail. Right. In jail meaning it stops it expressing. Yeah. So but you, is, you inhibit that by stress, high arginine, right. peanuts, yeah. um, there is a method, sunburn. There yeah. is a method of taking Epstein-Barr. If you lived with those huge lymph nodes under the chin and the raging inflammation of the back of the throat, you wouldn't live long. Mm. So we and the virus come to an agreed solution, which is you have a little bit of real estate, you've got little backyards here and there, you can play in those ones. And as long as you, as Epstein-Barr, stay nice and quiet, we don't get upset about you. And the immunoglobulin G is just a marker of the police are in the area. They'll, you know, they will be paying attention to you if you try and escape. What then changes, as you alluded to, is the virus is there. You've had the acute infection. Whether you knew it or not, the virus is just sitting there. And then something, a stressor in the broad, you know, hand salier type stressor mm. comes along, diminishes host defenses, and suddenly the efficiency of keeping that virus under control is lost. Now, as I said, the high school certificate year is the typical year. You have the perfect storm of people kissing, lots of Epstein-Barr virus around, the transfer from person to person, and stresses of poor sleep, high demands, um, tendency towards having a bit of alcohol, drugs, or something to stay awake, sleep loss while study is caught up on. And the virus is being a virus just says, bingo, Thanks. you know, mm. <laughs> this, is the, this is party time. And it gets out and once it gets away from the person, that person is sickened severely a second time. The fascinating thing for me is if it's the youngster and it's the first time you get the classic glands coming up, if they've already had it, you don't get the classic appearance. You get extreme fatigue. You get the lymph nodes coming up all up and down the neck, but no really huge ones. And you get the person just sleeping, you know, 14, 16, 18 hours a day. Hence the chronic fatigue yeah. type theory. Now here's the, the philosophical side, which I don't want to get into is there are times when we overdo something and it's not good for us. Mm. The upside that my patients tell me and that I've learned over many, many years is that when you have Epstein-Barr virus, it's almost like a little switch that says, hmm, pushing too far, we're going to flick a switch here. We're going to turn you down. You will be forced to sleep. You can't study. Mm. All of these yep. things happen. The, most the, other the, animals... The sickness. Yeah, syndrome. most yeah. other animals that become unwell rest because there's nothing else to do. Humans have a high school certificate. You've got to keep studying. Mm. And so we ignore that. We take coffee. We try and stay awake. We do things which counter the biology, which is saying, you will now rest. There is no option. Mm. Mm. And we push it beyond that edge. And you do get this story of a person going downhill, 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 and then one day they wake up and they've fallen off the cliff's yep. edge. yeah. And that moment, most of the HSC people can put a date on it. They know the day mm. that it happened and they say it happened on one day. But when you go back in the history, there was a three-month period before where little things were going wrong, where the nodes were up, where they were saying I wasn't feeling great. And the Epstein-Barr has at least a degree of predictability to it. It has three homes in the body. The first one, 100% of the time, is the nasopharynx. And if you look at the back of the throat, you do see the red arches on either side. If people have got tonsils, there's a bit of swelling around there. It's not rocket science because you see the IgG antibodies. They have had glandular fever. It's red again. Why would it be red? The second place, more than half of all the Epstein-Barr viruses in the initial infection get to the liver. 
and they make their home in the liver. It's not such a great place for them. It's not as ideal for them, but they persist there in low numbers. And so you get people go yellow and their liver function tests change and they get Epstein-Barr hepatitis when so they, they first get So they sick. actually show signs of jaundice, though? In the, early, in the first stage, right. they show that. What happens then is the virus goes quiet, and when it replicates, you find these mild transaminase, AST and ALT, these kind of enzymes which mark liver damage, that when they're sick, these start to become moderately abnormal, the liver's tender, the naturopath's saying you've got, you know, a stressed liver. And so for that 50% of people, which is, you know, 45, 50, close to 50% of the population, there is a liver which is also virally filled capable of replicating and capable of diminishing one secondary line of defense. Big organ filters everything from the gut. Now you've got a liver that is compromised. What do teenagers also do? They eat a lot of carbohydrates, mm. they have a lot mm. of junk food, and mm. they get a lot of antibiotics from us doctors. Mm. And so the Hormonal liver... Hormonal surges. That's right. The liver compromised is the secondary effect of the Epstein-Barr virus. Mm. And so we say, why would your liver be bad? You're not drinking that much. But the virus is capable of replicating there. In rare cases, you even see overt hepatitis. The bilirubin goes high, they start to look yellow if, it is, if it's bad enough. But that mild liver function abnormality, I used to disparage. And I'd see naturopaths go, oh, your liver needs help. You never, you know, these, these things look okay to me in the testing but then something happens, they go out, and you think, gee, the liver was on edge. We just never noticed it. It was getting close, mm. didn't fall over, and now it did. Would you also be getting the more classical signs of a viral infection, you know, when the virus invades the hypothalamus and upsets the temperature set point? So well, you start to get the night sweats, the chills. I think the evidence is Epstein-Barr does not get into the brain. Right. So their viruses have their own ways of acting. It doesn't get into the gut. It's not in the enterocytes as well. There are effects on the brain from the cytokines, right. from the immunology. And so I think a lot of what we say is that must be a, a viral infection or that may be encephalitis. If you had a viral encephalitis with something as capable as Epstein-Barr, you'd be dead. So I'm, I, I can be reasonably confident that we're seeing the body's immune response to where the virus is replicating, sabotaging brain function and causing a lot of the neurological effects. There are surprises here. I mean, Martin Lerner is a researcher in America and he worked with Paul Cheney and others and, uh, and has done a lot of studies to show Epstein-Barr virus is also seen in cardiac cells. And so the heart, the compromise that was seen in chronic fatigue syndrome of low cardiac output ah. and maybe the hypotensive responses, this kind of POTS, postural right. orthostatic uh, uh, tachycardia, there is a bit of an argument because he biopsied hearts and showed that the heart cells had infected, were infected with Epstein-Barr but, virus. But if 95% of people are infected with EBV, it would be reasonable that you'd find it if you were looking at it's damaged It's not hearts. always there. So ah. there's the thing. Right. So the common areas are the nasopharynx, the liver, and I'll come to the last one, which I think is where the magic of this virus is. Um, and occasionally it gets to other organs, which is not its natural hiding place. So you, you have mycoplasma, can get to the lungs and the gut, mm. but occasionally gets to other cavities mm. in the body. So all of these bugs have their preferred living environments. They generally have a relationship with the host as the host never gets so sick that they can't manage or they don't die. And they occasionally they get to organs which they shouldn't get to. And Martin Lerner's thing was, here's the Epstein-Barr affected cardiac people they have abnormal or abnormalities of cardiac function which contributes to their fatigue syndrome. And I don't doubt that he's right because he's actually done the work of biopsy and finding it. The third place, though, that they hang out, and this is, I think, the big story that we're learning about Epstein-Barr, is about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, we knew that some of these viruses get into a group of lymphocytes called naive B cells or naive B lymphocytes. Naive doesn't mean, you know, they're just doping around the place, you know, not knowing about life. It means that they haven't been committed to fight anything. So yeah, yeah. when we start life, nearly all of our B cells, B lymphocytes are naive. And as we go on through life, more and more of them get committed to do a particular job. Once they're committed, they tighten up their DNA. They produce a particular antibody. Each B cell produces only one and we know how they clone themselves. So they'll fight the flu, they'll fight the, you know, a candida, they'll fight something and they're committed. The younger you're infected, the more naive B lymphocytes you've got. Now we thought only 5% were infected. Now the current research says no, 95% 
of people have infection of the naive B lymphocytes. These are lymphocytes that are waiting to be given a job, but the virus gets them before they've got that job. It sits quietly in their DNA inside the nucleus, and then when that lymphocyte in the future gets called on to do something, what does it do? It clones itself massively, and it clones the virus massively when it does that. So this is almost like the classic Trojan horse. You put your virus inside a cell that's just sitting there doing nothing. It seems innocuous, nothing goes on. And then, say, six weeks, six months or ten years later, that cell gets the message from an immune system saying, hang on, we've got this thing called candida here. We've never seen it before, but your job will be to do something to produce antibodies about this. And the little immune cell goes, right, Captain, you know, I'm going to make billions of myself in order to do that job. And every time that cell divides, the Epstein-Barr goes on the back of it. It just divides along with it and sits there. And then while the body's immune system is busy fighting that other thing, the Epstein-Barr virus replicates itself and starts shedding again. So it's the opportunistic viruses, it's riding on the back of an immune system fighting something else. While that immune system is distracted fighting that something else, the Epstein-Barr virus is being cloned by our own body's response and appears again. It doesn't give the classic signs of any infection. What it does is it replicates and induces those antibodies that have been grumbling there saying, hey, come on, you've got to get back in your shell again. Go back to where you were. And that low-grade immune response to try and push the virus back to behave itself and not to replicate too far seems to be where the fatigue comes from. But you're getting B cells which sort of originate in bone. Yep. And then you've got things like T cell initiation or responses. Indeed, you've got a rare cancer, thymoma, mm -hmm. a cancer of the thymus gland yep. um, attributed to EBV. So t talk to us about this. We had, we had a division of cell-mediated versus humoral mm. immunity. And so in the old days, everyone was... Well, these are T cells derived from the thymus, and these are B cells, and they're derived from the bone marrow. And we had a nice and never division. the twain shall meet. Yeah, and, and life got far more complicated. T mm. regulatory cells and T cells turn on and turn off B cells. There is an ability of these various cells to express themselves. They're all moderated in the early days through the thymus. So the thymus does a lot of the selecting. If the thymus is busily selecting those cells, then the T cells certainly play a part in it, and the potential for the virus to enter T cells is certainly present. And so the virus is not, as I said, it's not absolutely committed to nasopharynx, liver, mm, mm. and the naive B cells. You give it enough of a playground to play in, it'll find its way into other areas, right. and it's nearly always a worse outcome. Why doesn't it happen all the time? Because if the virus killed its hosts all the time, we may not get to the point where we're kissing and passing it on. So there is a natural evolutionary pressure for viruses to have an investment in their host staying alive. Now, I have to interject here because this is something that confuses the hell out of me, and I know that it's off topic. Mm -hmm. Ebola virus. I don't understand why, if it's so pathogenic, if it's so devastating, how does it survive in the wild? Is it, has it got a, a carrier like in uh, what is it the the bush meat? Hey, it's I mean I'm, maybe that's a time. whole that is a whole <laughs> other story. But I, there is this combination of infectivity. Ebola is highly transmissible, mm. so it doesn't have quite the same investment in the host staying alive. But it is self. Um, limiting. As you saw, you know, there was a lot of effort putting into controlling Ebola virus, but it was controllable. Mm. You try and control Epstein-Barr virus, you will not succeed. No, no, that's right. And so Ebola virus or Ebola virus is one of those pathogens where everyone's sitting at it looking and saying, is it as fatal as we thought? The common problem that we have as first world people is not understanding that if you put war, poverty, starvation anywhere, you open the gate for anything to become potentially fatally pathogenic. Right. And so we keep on saying <gasps> measles will kill everybody. Measles will kill a naive population, but it also will come back when war and devastation and problems arise. And bluntly, pathogens are there to mop up the mess that happens after we've damaged things in so many other ways. And so I don't, I don't think you can make a, a comparison there. But still, just let's get to the end of this. You've got a virus now that lives happily in the throat, that we don't know anything that kills it, and it sits there in sufficient numbers just to keep itself ticking over. Mm, mm. A really healthy person, that's all that no. goes on. Yep. 
and they die with a little bit more day a day and the Epstein Barr says, you know, so long, thanks for the fish, we're done here and off they go. But the virus that's going to be successful is one that's learned, what's, what does this host do? You know, what, how does it fight other things? Where's my next, you know, car ride to the city? How am I going to get breeding again? And many of these cytomegalovirus and uh, human herpes, uh, well, say, let's say herpes too, have found ways sexual transmission. They've found cold sores through kissing. So you get ways of transmission. You know, um, hepatitis is transferred through blood contact. They're relatively rare. So everything has its trick, but the Epstein-Barr has got two tricks. One is it doesn't tie itself into single strands of DNA. It's circular DNA, and so it's protected from a lot of the repair mechanisms that our DNA otherwise has in place, and it has three preferred homes, the nasopharynx, the liver, if it can get there, and then the naive immune cells. And the naive immune cells are the beauties because they're self-replicating and they will go off like firecrackers every time you see it. Mm. From the virus's perspective... The best home possible is a naive immune cell that's going to fight something very common in the future. And for the person who gets recurrent strep throats, the person who gets recurrent eye infections, something, the bad luck of having Epstein-Barr occupying your immune cells that Mm. are going to pick that fight means it's going to catch a free ride every single time you do the job that your immune system is meant to do. So I'm thinking about not just infections, but other stressors to the immune system like allergies, chronic rhinosinusitis. Yeah, absolutely true. We do know that this thing expresses itself far, far more uh, aggressively in people who've got recurrent irritation and inflammation of the upper respiratory tract. So therefore, just thinking about the, the, if you like, the sequelae of symptomatology, sorry, big words, but but how people present and and the timeline of that, do people get chronic fatigue and one of the presentations of that is allergies or do people have allergies and they just then present the chronic fatigue because some other stress or... Yeah threw them down the chasm. Allergy is, in my mind, very definitely a predisposing factor. So what I do in my practice is we line up what were the predispositions. If you look at allergy, allergy is present in around about maybe 30% of the population. So it's a big slab of the population. When I ask my patients, probably 60% tend to have allergy. And it's one method of irritation that opens up the nasopharynx to infection. There, there are plenty of other stressors in life. And what we've become is a kind of monoculture of how we eat, and especially in our first world where we do see Epstein-Barr related to chronic fatigue syndrome. What we've done is we've created a culture where the person who can manage sugar, manage a supermarket, eat their diet like that, manage sleeplessness and heavily stressful jobs, they can be relatively immune to it. They can be doing everything wrong and still that virus doesn't get a chance. Yeah. And for the small percentage where it never gets to the immune cells, where the initial infection fails, there's no method of replication. It just sits in the throat and you'll get a bit of a sore throat each time, but you don't get fatigue syndromes or other problems. So yes, what's the art of medicine? The art of medicine is where were all the predisposing factors? There is one that everyone knows about who's ever listened to us, and that's the methylation. What does the body do to stop a herpes virus from replicating? It methylates its DNA. Uh you have poor methylators who get by fine when the stresses are not high, when they don't have to, you know, 100,000 jobs requiring rapid methylation. And there is certainly something of the high rate of the MTHFR homozygous group that keeps on making these people turn up. And the obvious thing is, since you require methylation, acetylation, histone formation, that's the trick the body has to stop the virus just replicating and doing that job over and over. Give those methylators something. I'm kind of getting into our next one. But give methylation a chance and you do something to inhibit viral replication and viral progression and you can bring it to an end a lot quicker. So really good methylators Mm. have a big advantage when it comes to stopping herpes viruses from replicating themselves. We'll go into others on the next occasion, but that is just one little gem along the way that since we know certain predispositions, allergy is one, poor methylation is one, immune activation. What do we know about from, uh, you know, Alessio Fasano again? What happens when you get people with certain genetics exposed to gluten and the prolamines? It triggers their immune activation. Um, I can see that the next podcast is going to be a rather long and detailed one. <laughs> We're going to go into all sorts of rooms with this sort of thing. I agree. It, it's not just going to be a simple little here you here you go here you manage it. There's I think there's going to be 
several parts. Yeah, in I'm, this not, I'm not going to give the magic name of that one antiviral <laughs> antibiotic, although there are people in America, you know, they are proposing, oh, we've used antivirals and we can diminish chronic fatigue syndrome by 50%. But that's not what we're about to talk about. We're about to talk about, we know the life cycle of this little fella. Mm. What can we do to make it safe for teenagers to enter their HSC years? What can we do to minimize the risk of that viral replication? And in the extreme, what do we know about how to turn this little bugger down so that it and us get together and we have a happy life together and a good and healthy life rather than one that is stuck with these rocks on which we, you know, smash our health? Dr. Mark Donohoe, you, uh, you're an absolute genius. I, like, I just, I learned so I'd much. I'd love every... to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> this only took me 30 years. <laughs> I nearly said the bad word. But you always teach me, indeed us, so much. And it's your clinical experience, those decades of experience mm. yeah. uh, of seeing patients and trialling new things, seeing where the research is going, where it's passed, where it's failed, where we needed to tweak it. That's what I love about talking with you is that you bring these really salient things that we now have a much clearer picture of to the table to help our practitioner listeners. So thank you so much for joining it's us again. It's been my pleasure. Well, I, feel, I feel half finished at the moment. <laughs> I'm busting to get on to yes. our next one. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for half finishing. <laughs> and we'll see you again soon. Yes, you will. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. If you're loving our FX Medicine podcasts, please don't forget to share us with your colleagues, family and friends. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today on FX Medicine, please engage with us and let us know what further topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in contact with us through our website, fxmedicine.com.au or look for FX Medicine in your favourite social media platform. You can also rate and review us on iTunes and we'd really like to thank those who have already rated us. It's through your continued support that enables us to bring you current, complex and relevant topics to enhance your practice of natural medicine.